Good morning. It is a great pleasure to introduce my dear friend, the Honorable Mona Makram Abade. Mona has been a distinguished lecturer at the American University in Cairo in political science for many years. She was a member of the Parliament of Egypt where she served on the Education and on Foreign Affairs Committees. She has also been a member of the Egyptian Senate. Mona, as a graduate of AUC, from which she received a master's degree, and has another master's degree from the Kennedy School at Harvard University. She is a recipient of our Distinguished Alumni Award. Mona has also been an advisor to the World Bank and is a founding member of the Arab Organization for Human Rights. I give you the Honorable Mona Makram Abade. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be with you once more from last year. And I thank the National Council of Foreign Relations of U.S. Arab Relations for inviting me, and particularly my good friends John Duke and Cynthia. Um, I was asked to speak about the state of Egypt today and U.S.-Egyptian relations. So I hope you will share with me and ask questions, if possible, at the end of my talk. It's hard to believe that six years have already passed since we were down in Tahrir Square, full of hope and trepidation that we were making history and where optimism and openness shaped the political climate. Egyptians are now discovering that there is more to a revolution than toppling a president. Since the emergence of modern nationalism in Arabic-speaking countries, intellectuals and political elites are caught between two options. One is the supremacy of al-umma al-islamiyya, which means the nation of Islam, and the other one is the requirement of the modern secular nation. This has been the ongoing debate for the past decades in the Arab world. Egypt, as you know, is the most populous Arab nation, about 94 million. It is a major Muslim country with a significant non-Muslim minority, the Christian Copts, who number around 15% of the population. Since 1952 and the toppling of the Egyptian monarchy, all the leaders from Nasser to Sadat to Mubarak and now to Sisi have hailed from the military and assumed power at a time of national trauma. They have all used secular nationalistic political vehicles to monopolize the power of the state. They all retained military backing through extensive political and financial patronage. They demonized Islamist political forces, all of them, and drove them underground, keeping a tight lid at the same time on the media, the opposition, and all forms of dissent. And thanks to geostrategic calculations they all, at one point or another, enjoyed the support of the United States of America. You must be surprised that I did not mention the one-year-old government of the Muslim Brotherhood leader, Mohammed Mursi, who, after winning the June 2012 presidential election, rapidly lost support 
in 2013. His assertion of total executive power through the November 2012 constitutional declaration alienated a substantive cross-section of the Egyptian public, setting off frequent and often violent demonstrations that continued for months, and meanwhile, the economy plummeted and the tide of popular opinion shifted further and further against Morsi. Egypt's state institutions mutinied. I remember resigning from the Senate at the time when the Muslim Brotherhood, who dominated the Senate, refused to put pressure on Morsi to negotiate a political solution such as early elections or a referendum on his presidency. Instead, the Muslim brother indicated that they would use violence, which they did and continue to do. This is the context in which Egypt's military, led by then Defense Minister El Sisi, removed Morsi from power by popular impeachment. We do not call it and do not regard it a military coup because 20 to 30 million people were in the street asking for the army to intervene. And that happened on July the 3rd, 2013. At that point, Egypt was on the verge of severe civil strife, if not civil war. And we feared that the country was headed the way of Syria or Libya. I remember being summoned by an ex-minister on the 30th of June in the morning to join a group of high-level personalities and send a petition to the army to intervene. We also went out on television in the evening to announce that petition and read it out. So indeed, from the perspective of many Egyptians, unlike many in the West, Sisi's decision to oust Mursi saved Egypt from outright chaos. And this is very important to remember when discussing present-day politics in Egypt and the challenges that face it. The generals and their supporters believe that they must destroy the Brotherhood or risk the Brotherhood remobilizing, returning to power, and seeking vengeance for the overthrow of their leader. And here I would like to put a parenthesis. At this time, there were three forces who were competing for the control of Egypt. The army, the Muslim Brotherhood, and various other opposition organizations. The outcome depended on which two of these forces cooperate to overpower the third. If the two civilian actors had decided to work together to eventually defeat the military, the Brotherhood would have gained enough power to create a religious dictatorship and set Egypt back hundreds of years. That is why the civilian opposition organizations appealed to the army as they both understood that the Brotherhood is their common and most dangerous enemy. However, the alliance of civilians with the army against the Brotherhood will postpone full democracy and civilian control for some years and will let many of the economic beneficiaries of the Mubarak regime keep their positions. However, it may well be the fastest possible path towards sustainable democracy if certain requirements are met. But here, let me go back slightly in history to understand better the challenges facing Egypt today. The centrality of Egypt to modern Arab political life amplifies the need towards modernization, democratization, and secularization. However, the religious revival of the Arab world in general has clouded perceptions of recent history. Eugene R R Rogan, the well-known British historian, for example, asserts that given the prominence of Islam in public life today, it is easy to forget 
just how secular the Middle East was in 1981. Similarly, Kerry Rosefsky Wickham notes, quote unquote, that there is nothing natural about the success of Islamist outreach in a Muslim country, and this is indicated by the dominance of leftist movements in the Arab world as recently as the 60s and 70s. End of the quotation. That is to say that the ubiquity of Islamism is a thoroughly modern phenomenon and represents a major shift in the political landscape of the Arab world. In fact, Egypt's liberal tradition during the interwar period, that is 1919 to 1952, did produce an intellectual elite that valued and championed liberal thought. <laughs> At this time, this is the period that ushered in a period of military domination which started in 1952. Political power was concentrated in the Egyptian military who saw themselves as the country's only effective vanguard in the effort to modernize and develop the country and denied every other group other than the army the right and duty to lead the rebirth of Egypt. So on the, e on the eve of Egypt's uprising in January 2011, it was an authoritarian state uh, uh, under Mubarak, but it had long ceased to be a military regime. The military was removed from governance and civilian politics and more concentrated on the economic interests of the institution. The uprising therefore represented a major political opening for the Egyptian military and the aftermath of Egypt's failed political transition resulted in the military's direct intervention. However, the constructing of space for regional politics boosted the fortunes of political Islam in light of the lack of credible alternatives. In fact, on the eve of the January Revolution, the political scene had few ideological stances for mobilization aside from the Mu Muslim Brotherhood. With the result that the hierarchies within the present regime have evolved in a, in a way that prioritizes the military and the security establishment. The reliance of President Sisi on a close circle of military figures is matched by the regime's distrust of civilian politics and civilian politician, and has instead sought to cultivate a civilian political sphere that would serve as an obedient supporter of government politics. At the same time, the increasing role of Egypt's military has been driven by a lack of trust in non-military alternatives, the administrative ease of military-led projects, an immediate focus on job creation, and an affinity for mega projects such as the Suez Canal, the new capital, solar energy, infrastructures, etc. As for civil society, it is under relentless pressure and its activities have been severely curtailed, particularly the NGOs. Today, but today a rethinking is taking place, albeit among existential fears, both among regime supporters and in a broad cross-section of the population focused on the rising threat, threat of radicalization anti-state violence and terrorism. As a result, non-Islamists have come to see the military and the institutions of the state as the primary defense against Islamic ambitions to remake the state and redefine Egyptian identity. Needless to say, this conference of events is not conducive to producing an open and pluralistic style of politics. The radicalization of certain Islamist groups, particularly in the Sinai, and their brutal attacks against Christian citizens and their churches, with the threat of continued violence and terrorism, became a first order priority for the president and emboldened the security establishment and made for a situation that inhibits politics and risk taking. In other words, 
Regional insecurity limits the possibility for genuine political openings, and these political trends are also being strengthened by the global environment, which has witnessed an upsurge in right-wing populist dem demagoguery. Two factors could have been made different this time. The first is demogra demographic. There is a peril in having millions of undereducated, underemployed young men and women with very little to lose, living very difficult lives amid a lack of basic service. However, polarization in Egypt has been experiencing in the past six years, marginalized the youth, these the young forces that, and the women who were at the forefront of the revolution. The second factor is economic. Egypt confronts acute challenges relating to its fiscal structure, competi competitiveness, and education system. And now I shall move to the re relations with the United States. Let me first ask two questions. What are Washington's options in a changed Middle East environment? And two, what is the role of financial aid? Let me start by saying one important thing for you to keep in mind, and that is that Egyptian politics cannot be viewed through the lens of American democracy, but rather relatively in a more nuanced fashion and as a work in progress. Egypt for decades has been one of Washington's closest Middle Eastern allies, and U.S. military aid to the rate of $1.3 billion annually has served to entrench the 1971 79 peace deal with Israel. Egypt has long been viewed by the U.S. as a linchpin of its regional foreign policy, as well as an essential conduit through which to project power and protect its interests. Under President Obama, the relationship was badly damaged because of his backing Mubarak's ouster in favor of the Muslim Brotherhood affiliated Mohamed Morsi. The souring relations continued after the latter was deposed by President Sisi in the wake of a popular impeachment, as I said. Uh, and so the Obama administration then withheld most of the 1.3 billion in annual military aid. This was a lose-lose proposition, as withholding military aid had no impact on Egypt's domestic policy. It also announced the end of cash flow financing of aid to Egypt after 2017. As a result, the U.S.-Egyptian relationship remained tense and Cairo turned to other partners for weapons, including partners that do not necessarily share U.S. interests in the Middle East. 2016, enter President Donald Trump, who moved immediately to reset bilateral ties, inviting the Egyptian president to the White House, praising him, and vowed to work <coughs> together to fight Sinai-based Islamists. Then, without warning, in an apparent course reversal in late August this year, the State Department announced it was withholding $95.7 million in aid to Egypt and delaying a further $195 million, ostensibly over concern about the country's deteriorating human rights record, but mainly because its relation with North Korea. The move came as a shock to, Egy to Egyptian officials, but then, just as suddenly, in another apparent backtrack and amid obvious internal confusion within the State Department, President Trump reportedly called President Sisi to reaffirm the strength of their friendship, which would overcome any obstacles, quote unquote. I don't have to underline the unpredictability of certain presidents, but it is clear from the above that foreign aid, particularly American aid payments, act both as, as a political bribe as 
it is also an economic support. Fueling tension is not in Washington's interests, given Egypt's role as an important U.S. strategic partner. Egypt has maintained a peace treaty with Israel since 1977 and coordinates with Washington most of the time on a wide range of regional activities, including counterterrorism and diplomacy. Washington further relies on Egypt to grant preferred access in the Suez Canal and over flight rights to equip the U.S. military bases in the Persian Gulf. On the other hand, Egypt is aggressively battling jihadists in the Sinai, during which hundreds of Egyptian security personnel and civilians were killed, are killed almost on a daily basis. Today, Egypt is more secure now and on a path to economic recovery without, uh, without the jihadist ruling. To be sure, the administration is right to be concerned about Egypt's domestic political trajectory and it should use its diplomatic engagement with the Sisi government to encourage greater tolerance and political pluralism. But if Washington conditions its strategic relationship with Cairo on its progress towards democracy, it won't achieve democracy, given the current circumstances and will hurt the bilateral relations in the process. On the contrary, the relationship should be based on shared strategic interests Specifically, Congress should encourage the Trump administration to proceed with the strategic dialogue that Cairo has requested since early 2014. This will be an important opportunity to review the military aid relationship in a bilateral setting and to coordinate both countries' strategies on a wide range of regional challenges. Particularly that Egypt needs American support in order to sustain the reforms that they need to change Egypt, in fact, to rebrand Egypt. Having inherited an economy in shambles, he has initiated major infrastructure projects. The other bone of contention is the draconian legislation regulating NGOs and aid agencies, particularly those funded by the West. When I was in the Senate, I spoke vehemently against this law, as it was, and I believe, that today there is indications of more flexibility towards the NGOs. Uh, on the other hand, the resumption of the joint military exercises by the name of Bright Star are more than merely symbolic and could be seen as... Uh, I want to end here by saying uh, there is a French... Uh, French a French uh, work of art called En attendant Godot. So I will end by saying, En attendant Mr. Trump, we will know the result of our relation. Thank you. Question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question uh, from someone in the audience. Uh, <clears throat> how would you describe, how would you analyze, how would you assess uh, the position and role of American supported NGOs in Egypt? Um, some uh, received their licenses long ago. Some have um, been told that, don't worry, um, you're doing such great work, you needn't uh, be concerned about anything. And then, boom, uh, uh, many oppose them as being agents of a foreign power, as being intrusive in the domestic affairs of Egypt, as eroding, corroding aspects of Egypt's sovereignty, etc. cetera. Um, and how would you gauge the effect of uh, American University in Cairo and how on Egypt's development? 
uh, and on Egypt-USA relations. Uh, this this one question. Yeah, thank you for the question that looks more like a lecture than a question, but anyway, no. I'll try to answer and, it. And those uh, in the energy session, please be prepared to uh, come to the dais. About the NGOs, as I said, uh, many of us in the opposition, and writers, etc., when I was in the Senate, I uh, opposed the draconian legislation that prevented NGOs from working, particularly those who worked with Western funds. Now, it's been going on for some time, and uh, NDI, IRI, all these were affected, but I believe that there is a change, and particularly that now the German NGOs like Konrad Adenauer, Friedrich Ebert, and Friedrich Neumann have been almost uh, revamped and re-accepted to uh, pursue their, um, their work, the work that they used to do. So I believe for the Americans it is also in the pipeline and it will come eventually. Mm -hmm. And that's the good news that I announced to the NDI yesterday when I went to see them. Now, what's the question on the American University? On the influence of American University on economic on development in Egypt and U.S.-Egypt relations. The influence of the American University? I don't think it has much influence. All it has is it, it makes the students pay a lot of money now, <laughs> much more than it was expected. I used to pay a fifth of what people are paying today. It's absolutely ridiculous, and my heart is with the new president, who is a wonderful president. He was the former U.S. ambassador to Egypt, Frank Ricciardoni, but he is in the middle of demonstrations from parents, from students, from everyone, <coughs> because after the flotation of the pound, the prices have soared so much. Now, I don't know what they have to do with the economics. I wish they had, but I think they will be the victim also of the rotation of the pound. The mm -hmm. third one is what? That's it. Uh, uh, thank you. That's uh, all we have time for. You covered a wide landscape uh, and painted uh, a portrait of Egypt in general and, and some detail that would be hard to obtain in any other way except by listening to someone like you, Mona Makram Abey. Thank you. And will the energy session please come forward? <laughs>